Okay. So, um, um, uh, Bradley, the node PRs are probably the highest priority of the things that we uh, uh, just discussed as candidates, candidate topics. Um, sure. So, uh, like I mentioned last time, we've created a PR for data URLs. Um, it does have some implications, but uh, nobody's blocking it so far. So if nothing happens, it'll probably be merged into the experimental flag uh, in a week or two. We also opened up another PR for fixing a uh, problem where if somebody modified a policy on disk, uh, we didn't have a way of mitigating and preventing Node from running, so we just added a integrity check to the policy file itself that you can add via the command line. That one's all approved and just waiting uh, the standard time limit before we add it. And we have an upcoming PR either tomorrow or next week where we're going to be pushing a new field into the policy files. In particular, uh, for every resource listed in the policy file, they will be able to include some form of mapping currently under the key dependencies that maps from a request specifier to another resource. So if you are requesting FS, uh, and you want to provide an alternative implementation or an attenuated implementation. Okay. Uh, have the key in this dependencies uh, object be FS and the value at it be a path absolute as a URL to your alternative. So this would, this would be, um, uh, this would be the thing that you were mentioning that was, like the uh, manifest for least authority module linkage that we've been talking about in these meetings. Correct. So there are a few differences here. Um, in particular, the way that CommonJS actually does resolution at runtime is kind of all over the place. So if you specify true, um, which for at least the safe modules proposal, uh, that would mean essentially you get the unattenuated form. Uh, mm -hmm. We actually mm -hmm. don't require you to specify an absolute location. Um, the absolute location actually should be covered by the policy itself since the policy covers all possible things that could be loaded through the loader. Um, if you try to load in an alternate uh, location, by injecting something onto the file system or something like that, it'll already fail. So, could you uh, could you put up could you put up an example that you can be pointing at while you're talking about these? Uh, I can even do stuff. So, okay. This is a little bit last minute. So, um, so a policy file. This is a big JSON blob. Um, it's got a bunch of resources. We have a CLI tool to make this easier, but this is a good example policy. Uh, we have a main file and we have an empty file. Uh, the main file has a specific set of integrities. As long as one are matched, uh, it's considered valid. So okay. it also has an integrity check in here. If you don't include an integrity, it's not gonna load. Um, if you don't include this dependencies hash, you can't import or require anything. Uh, if you do include a dependencies hash, uh, anything as a specifier uh, will be resolved um, to something through an absolute uh, URL that's computed when the policy is loaded. So these are not computed on the fly. Um, however, there is an exception to this. If instead of loading FS, which is a built-in, we were to load some third-party module, say Browserify, um, and you specify the value true, which essentially says, uh, give me the unattenuated form. Um, mm -hmm. You don't need, you are not specifying the absolute location 
of that within this dependencies dictionary. Um, because of that, we will load it from any location that's valid within the policy as a whole. So the policy as a whole treats resources as having a location and integrity pair. Um, in order to load uh, Browserify in this manner, if you set it to true, it would still need to be listed in the policy. policy. Um, what, what, is, what is the integrity hash uh, uh, asserting? So this inserts that the, for JavaScript, this is a, checking that the source text matches some sub-resource integrity string. Sub-resource integrity strings are a standard for the web. Uh, basically, they allow you to have a series of different hashes associated with uh, an algorithm. And if any one of these hash algorithm pairs matches the contents at a location, then that location is considered having that integrity. So it, it, and if, the, it, if it matches, if, if, the, if the contents ma matches the hash, why do you care where it came from? Uh, what do you mean where it came from? You said location. Uh, yes. So because there are some path searching mechanisms within Node, you can actually exploit things. Uh, regarding this, this is actually an OAuth uh, vulnerability as well. Um, so OWASP uh, has this as one thing. You can kind of see it as similar to uh, Simlink stuff where you can actually inject something and intercept the resolution or delete something from path and cause it to cascade to a path in a different location. Uh, um, what is the hash a hash of? The source text that would be loaded in this case. Okay, in which case I, I, I still don't understand the answer to my question. I might not have fully understood your question. If the source text matches the hash, what difference does it make? What location the source uh, text okay. was obtained from? So let's say I've got some module that hardens the HTTP API in some way, correct? Okay. Um, right. If I replace that module with another valid source text that's listed in the policy, and I do not assert its location, then I could have something like a JSON parser or no opping uh, polyfill essentially uh, replace that hardening API and it no longer acts within the application because I haven't asserted the location is also correct. So this is a bug. So there's a very popular library helmet. We had this discussion with Dayan a long time ago on these meetings uh, where Intrinsic is doing checks purely based upon the integrity. They do not check against location as well. Um, so what you can do in these things that only check for integrity is you find a benign alternative to a module and you replace the contents of a location with that benign alternatives contents. So if these hardening APIs through modules are replaced with benign ones, you no longer have the hardening effect. I just missed uh, several minutes uh, uh, for a very stupid reason. Uh, Dean uh, hand signaled me, am I in the meeting? I'm in the meeting through AirPods, so I tapped my AirPod to indicate to Dean visually that I was in the meeting, and in so doing, I hung up. <laughs> <laughs> So just quick, quick answer, because I've kind of started to understand the question better. Um, if you only assert things based upon the integrity, you lose important assertions about loading modules that have effect, effectful natures. Um, in particular, modules kind of like NPM's helmet module are made in order to prevent some common uh, cross-site request forgery things by modifying the HTTP hooks in Node. Um, if you assert only with integrity, you could replace the contents of this hardening module, this helmet module, with something like a polyfill for promises, which 
they're all over node apps i'm sure how can you how could you how could it be replaced and still match the integrity check uh because you don't know the location but why do i i literally don't care about the location all i care about is the sequence of bits that is the source. So you have approved a promise polyfill somewhere in your application so you replace the hardening uh contents with the nine alternatives confused deputy yes and so this problem is reproducible in intrinsic's approach. And they do not uh, why, an error. Stupid. Chip, while you're still experiencing your aha, because I'm not getting it yet, can you explain what your aha was? Uh, the, um, if, I, if I'm understanding what Bradley just said correctly, and, and, and I count on him to jump in if I'm not, um, uh, all you're saying is um, uh, it, it, it is a it is an ambient um, determination of is this module acceptable or not not is this module the module that I asked for in this context and so um, if somebody imports um, um, uh, and so what, 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 what you could do is you can um, substitute one acceptable thing for a different acceptable thing and gain different effect. I'm sorry, what's, what's the question we're answering? Oh, the question I asked was, why do I care about the location? Why don't what I do, just what care do you... about the integrity check? Because all I care about okay. is one of the bits of the source file. Okay, by, by location, uh, I, I think I might have begotten, I think that this might be where a misunderstanding. What do you mean by location? I interpret it as meaning where I fetched the file from. Is that wrong? So, uh, so if that's what you mean, then I still don't understand the aha. The thing that I would think I care about is the association of specifier name to integrity hash. So the specifier name is the local namespace, the namespace that, that relates to um, uh, the, you know, how modules name other modules, but the location out there on the web where the text is fetched from, I still don't care. Um, as long, but, but, I, but, I, but, I, but I don't care about it, but, but it's correct that it's not that I have a set of integrity hashes that irrespective of local names, that would be a confused deputy. But as long as they're, you know, as long as it's a local name associated with an integrity check, why isn't that enough? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I understand now. I think maybe my aha was a mirage. Okay. So how about I just write an example? Okay. Uh, we're, we're not gonna have a working I'm not going to have a working example. Uh, uh, so we're going to we're going to make a b or uh, a harden app harden and benign. Okay. 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 So this is app. We're going to require pardon. And we're going to call it because let's assume it's some kind of function. Just forget okay. the APIs. Just, just forgive them. Um, and then we are in harden and we're going to export some function. Exports equals function. And what is this function going to do? We're going to say um, delete delete that now. I don't know. It does something. Okay. Something okay. we find attractive to get rid of. Um, okay. Benign, which I misspelled. Um, okay. We're gonna, we're gonna have this do something completely unrelated. We're gonna be like, if not promise 
It's it's let's call it banal. I don't want to talk about it. Okay. Sure. Just call it, just call it banal. So okay. we have app. All it's trying to do is this. It's just trying to okay. call harden. Right. We have benign. Okay. All it's trying to do is this thing, whatever we want to call that. Um, okay. If we only care about integrities, if we do not care about locations at all. Wait, wait, hold, hold on. What do you mean by location? Uh, the location, it is pulled off disk, the resolved location, not the requested location. Not the what location? Requested. Right, okay. But it's, it's also, it doesn't have to do with uh, you know, where on the web you got it from. It has to do with the specifier namespace. It has to do with um, you know, what, what names module used, you, modules used to talk about other modules, and then how that's mapped through the policy file. Where, where out in the world you got the bits from still should not matter, correct? No, where you get it from matters, and we're about to kind of discuss why. Okay. Um, so, if we only care about the bits, if we don't care about the specifier. So I'm, I'm not saying, no, no, I'm not saying only care about the bits. I'm saying care about the mapping from specifiers to bits. That so is, we don't care that where in the world the bits came from. Uh, you could view it that way. I do not personally view it that way. Okay. What other way is there to do it? Can I just try to? Yeah, yeah, what are, yeah, yeah. Expand on your yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 If yeah. we only care about the bits, um, we can take this, and we can basically nuke our harden. So harden does something we we find useful, right? Mm -hmm. We're gonna just back this up, and then we're gonna copy uh, the nine onto Harden, mm -hmm. top of Harden. So now, since I assume we've approved all three of these for different reasons, when app attempts to Harden our environment, it in reality just kind of does this polyfill thing. Um, this API needs to be changed so it's callable, but I mean, uh, there's a bunch of ways you can avoid this. You've taken okay. a benign module and replaced a important securing module. And since we don't have a location, according to this, it passes policy checks if we don't associate location and integrity. Okay. There, so this is not, so, 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 so I, think, I think Chip and I understand this, and it's not the question that I'm asking. Okay. What's the question? Okay. Uh, the reason this would fail the kind of local integrity check that I have in mind is the local integrity check would associate local names, that, you know, the specifier names, like the dot harden JS would associate, I mean, the dot slash harden JS would associate that with a hash and since benign doesn't have that hash, it would fail. So the integrity check that I have in mind would still protect us against this attack, even though both, both hashes themselves appear in integrity, they don't appear associated with the right names. Correct. But I don't care, but, but I shouldn't need to care where on the web I obtained the source for either hardened or benign for. All I care about is the specifier namespace, not the external world uh, location that I, that I fetch the sources from. I don't believe that's true. Um, if you could go over a bunch of things with me and some example cases, we could discuss that at length maybe some other time, but that's kind of out of this. For now, we don't do that. We can change that. I don't see a problem if I find it compelling. Um, for now, what we are doing is we are using the absolute locations because the absolute locations 
are already associated with integrity checks. When you say absolute locations, can you- uh, Absolute what is, URL where it is fetched off disk in this case. So this FS expands to some absolute- Oh, URL. I see. Oh, I see. I URL see. necessarily has an integrity associated with it. Okay. Um, I do think there are potential problems with not associating this with a location. We can discuss that at large if desired. Uh, so, so, okay. So how, where is the location associated? Where is the location? Uh, all locations within a manifest for a policy are resolved relative to the manifest itself. No, no, I, 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 that's not what, that was not my, that, that may be true, but it's not the answer to the question I was asking. Um, what in this specif what, what in this is a location? Uh, a variety of things are, so keys of resources. Okay. And but that says policy. Hmm? This is also dot slash policy slash something dot js. Um, maybe I'm just being confused by the, the use of the name policy in the path there. Oh, that's just my example folder. Right. That's, that's, right. that's just what, this could be temp if you wanted it to be. I was just working within that directory. I, I, I see. So we're in, we're in a, 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 a program that's manipulating policy. So the things live in the policy directory, not that it is a directory full of policies because this Correct. is, this, this whole thing here is describing policy okay. within a file called policy.json. And so I was thinking, well, yeah, what do I care about the policy of the file? I care about the file itself. Um, um, okay, okay, I think, I, I think I'm following you there. Um, okay, and, and, and the location uh, is not, the, the location, as you said, is, is, this is, this is where I think I was confused, is the location you said is relative to the policy file, and since and that means you're you're talking about, you know, the local copy that you've obtained from somewhere. You still don't care where you obtained it, you, where you've obtained it from. You're just doing, you know, relative naming within your local copy. Uh, roughly, yes. Okay. Uh, we do resolve some stuff eagerly for pathing purposes. Stuff, I'm sorry, you do resolve some stuff eagerly for? Pathing purposes. So in theory, since something may have access to the file system, we actually need to resolve these URLs before we run user code. Otherwise they could mutate what's on disk. Uh -uh -uh. So okay, so this so this so um, so uh, what about so the 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 manifests that um, uh, that we've played with and discussed in these meetings and the ones that Kumavis did for MetaMask for Sessify, um, uh do this rewiring of modules to modules and once again with true for just give me the 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 unmapped one. Uh, we also do, um, uh, we also talk about what, what global variables should be in scope. Uh, is there, does this one, does this policy, policy file capture that? Should it? Uh, it does not currently. There's a separate person trying to push through a mechanism that would allow for such. That's Guy Bedford's okay. one. Uh, there okay, are two good. blockers on that one, in particular with people concerned either about performance or about viability overall. So uh, there's just ongoing talks there. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have some concerns raised in particular by Guy Bedford that policies should not be included in Node perhaps because instead user land loaders should be doing all of this work on their own. Um, but he is not wanting to block this being merged into the runtime. So. 
Yeah, I mean, the, 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 so let me, let me mention how I see the, the purpose of the policy files as it relates to user land uh, loaders uh, and see if it, it, it uh, sounds right to you guys, um, which is uh, um, simple things should be simple, complex things should be possible. That the user land loaders is, is sort of the ultimate complex thing should be possible, but uh, much of what you would express with user land loaders ha is simple rewiring of this to that. And so the, the policy files is basically a simple way to take care of the, you know, 90% of the cases, which are just simple name remappings and wirings and least authority constraints that are, that are simply stated. And then um, uh, for the, for the remaining uh, cases that can't be expressed simply that way, uh, then you resort to other mechanisms. And the first other mechanism you resort to is still actually within the declarative policy framework, which is uh, that you just write the attenuators with code that are modules, and then you use the policy file to rewire things through the attenuators. So it's the code and the attenuators that express attenuation that you can't express declaratively directly. Uh, and then finally, user level loaders for where uh, that framework is not adequate. Does that seem, does that all seem right? Um, to some extent, I would like to assert that I think user level loaders still need to be covered under policies, even though they are a power tool. So you cannot load a loader with an invalid integrity and things like that. That makes sense. I did not understand it. So loaders are a power tool. Yeah. Um, we have discussed isolation of them, which still have faces some pushback from mm -hmm. user code. Um, I would like to assert that loaders themselves uh, require integrity checks when they are starting up. Okay. They may. And the, the the integrity check would be on the loader itself or would it or is the integrity oh, check con okay a loader itself may escape the standard policy checks okay so in other words if the loader is approved then what it in turn does doesn't need further approval because the loader itself was approved and therefore we've decided to trust whatever its mechanism is for deciding what else to approve. Correct. I feel that way about most power tools as well. Okay, good, good. I understand that. That it, seems sensible. Uh, 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 wait, I, th if I think of that as it, it, if the loader is the thing whose job is to enforce, say, for example, this policy uh, mechanism that uh, Bradley has just been showing us, um, then at some point you have to bottom out and say, yes, we agree that this loader is the thing that enforces that policy and we will bless the loader directly. Yes. The loader may be able to query the uh, intended values, but that does not mean it will adhere to them. Okay. Okay, good. This makes sense to me. Another thing that I just um, just noticed is this policy file is all in terms of modules. Uh, is there um, uh, is there any attempt to be able to state things in terms of packages? Uh, not currently. The node policy CLI tool does have the capability of doing so, but there's been no need. To my knowledge, uh, if you want to create such things, um, we can work on designs for it. Um, essentially, that would just be carving out scopes within URL spaces, to my knowledge. So within so, some directory, some policy is applied. Okay, and are the, the policy files that we're looking at, um, uh, how does the, you know, how does the coexistence of automatically generating things with the Tofu tool versus manually stating policies uh, uh, coexist? How do, the, how do those two things uh, uh, interplay in the system? 
uh, tofu does generate a decent uh, amount of information that we could use to properly create these. Since we're about to put up the PR for this exact format, once we get the PR up, tofu will be updated in order to uh, work with a different CLI tool uh, called node policy. Uh, I think it's, I got a global install. Um, so we're working on this. Uh, there is a blocking requirement to unflag policies that this is merged somehow into nodes core. But basically, uh, there's a variety of things to just do integrity checks and stuff without running code, adding um, stuff or running an NPM install and having staged integrity during that. Okay, because one, one of the issues that we've discussed, I think Kamavis raised this, is that the tofu generated um, uh, files will be large and contain a lot of non-human understandable information like these, like these uh, SHA hashes. Uh, and then there'll be manual policy decisions which want to be maintained over time and want to be maintained in particular over the regeneration of the automatically generated. Uh, the tofu generated things. Um, uh, so uh, uh, some design where there is an ability to express the human generated overrides in a separable manner so that they're, um, so they, so they continue, so they generally continue to apply after regenerating the thing that they're um, advising that they're that they're a, a difference from or something. I'm not I'm not putting this well, but I think you understand um, what I mean. Yes. So you don't want to lose your modifications even after generating stuff. I don't think that's within scope of Node itself, but we could certainly add some diffing utils that would allow for something like that, where you can uh, essentially create patches that you apply uh, to generated stuff for tofu itself. That seems much easier to do it down there than to do it up at the runtime. So, and you're thinking of just, just version control style patches where it's just, it doesn't understand the structure of just looking at lines no, of text? No, uh, it's not gonna be a textual diff. It's gonna have to be some intelligent diff based upon the context of what's, what's applied. Isn't this, isn't this a build time thing? Uh, which? Well, presumably, if you have uh, the policy that gets shipped uh, with the the, the 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 aggregate thing that you're building, um, you'd like your build tool to be able to say, "Well, all of the stuff that is this is being built from right now is is okay." Uh, and it's okay because I am in complete control of the universe in the environment where I'm building it. And then, um, and then any exceptions uh, that well, I think will typically describe stuff which is external to that world can be, can, be, can be folded in as part of the build process. And those would be described in some, some separate artifact of some kind but would be that artifact would be incorporated into the generated policy by whatever your built and packaging tools are. Yes, I believe what Mark is just requesting is that we have the ability to have these uh, separate, I guess, files merged without losing uh, any human generated stuff. So right. human generated file, computer generated file, and you can create a third file, which is the combination of the two. Right. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Kumavis, did did um, uh, did you uh, have any thoughts based on your um, Sessify work about that separation between the uh, automatic generation and the uh, human, the separate expression of the human override? Well, right. So, so in, you're talking about the 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 tofu generation. That's like this really complex analysis. Yeah, and, then, and it it, gener it and it generates this manifest or this you know the, what we're now calling a policy file, mm -hmm. uh, but then there's human generated 
overrides where you're, you know, you're, you're deciding to wire something through an attenuator or whatever. Uh, and you want to be able to maintain the manual override uh, decisions across the regeneration of the tofu information. Yeah, so uh, basically having two files and, and then sort of like doing a deep merge on them. It, it, that's my current approach. Yep. Oh. What, what do you mean by a deep merge? Yeah, th that's a good question. And th that part needs to be like clear and straightforward, which is um, maybe a little tricky. But uh, if I want to be able to say, like, actually, for this global, you know, use this attenuated global or something like that without having, without accidentally destroying all the existing um, other global configuration for that. So, um, like, I don't want to just replace the global's configuration object with that one global I'm setting. Um, so how, how the best way to do that is, is not clear. Um, like, should you merge those two objects and then, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, that's the way I would go is merging the two objects. But in some cases, you're going to want to overwrite them. And I guess in the case that you want to overwrite them, you just need to explicitly set them to um, null or false or whatever. Didn't. So my expectation was the human generated file would actually be slightly different from the computer generated file. And so you would mark things as explicitly the uh, merge conflict or replacement style that you want. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that, that, that for example, if you are uh, attenuating uh, something with it with some attenuation code so that when somebody imports say FS um, and you have your version your attenuated FS um, it's essentially a, a, a pet name mapping and when you are declaring that you don't want to have your manual um, uh, uh, declaration that says well when I say FS I mean uh, the file with the following hash. What you mean is when I'm yeah. FS, I mean that file over there that I'm building from, um, and 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 that would get hashed and and put in there by the tool, um, so that when you when you have to make a change to your attenuation code because you're still developing it, um, that will just get automatically swept up in your next build. Yep, mine doesn't have the integrities, so, um, mm. so that is, you know, that's definitely like some, that's sort of a burden on the human readable side. Um, For sure. So I haven't really considered that. So just a note, these policy files will not be staying JSON just due to size problems. Mm. So eventually we will be moving off that to something that is 100% not human readable, and you'll need a tool. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I expect humans to be able to audit both the automatically generated config file for specify and the, the human overrides. So, I mean, yeah, like I already demonstrated that I'm going to, I have some visualization tools to help with that, but I'm, expecting you know these to be json files that are human readable and that you will include them in pull requests and you'll view the diffs and and, and that sort of thing so um i do have like an example of like how out of control these get you're, you're also doing things uh, per module whereas we're doing things per package uh yes these can be simplified down per module, but not, not super great. So this is just pure integrity, uh, which you have to do uh, regardless in this file. Um, and it's for a medium sized app and it's got like 45,000 lines of just yeah. roughly these three lines for like, it just goes on forever for 15,000 yeah. or so. Yeah, so I, I just don't have that level of complexity because I'm doing it at the package level. So uh, we can't do it at the package level, so I don't know. 
Yeah. That's not possible for us to do. Okay. Yeah. The, 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 the thing about the, for the inter for the developer interaction uh, uh, to think about least authority issues and all these policy issues and, uh, uh, you know, catching malicious upgrades. Uh, I think that the um, figuring out how to abstract this to be package oriented for the normal case is actually uh, quite important because the internals of a package is somebody else's concern. It's not the concern of the author of an application that's using a package. Um, uh, but the but the author of the application using the package is properly concerned about what authority is given to the uh, package as a whole. Um, that might not be true. So if we take a look at event stream, we actually had a package modify another package's internals. And so that was part of the problem is you developed a prototype attack from doing that. So even then you wanted to verify that the uh, method, I forget the name of it, it was some kind of cipher, um, was not modified. But that was still inter-package. Inter when, when one package depends on another, I'm still considering that to be, um, you know, we're flattened because, because the packages are uh, a graph, not a tree, um, that, um, that the policy file would name all the dependent packages as well and flatten that out. Uh, so we eventually, can't apply we'll... an integrity to a package. Why not? Uh, because it's on disk. You have to check every single file on disk. Well, you could do yeah. like a Merkle tree kind of thing. Uh, even then, a Merkle tree is just going to be a essentially large tree of hashes, and you still have to check yeah. everything on disk. Doing this for yeah. uh, forty-five thousand takes around five minutes. Nobody's going to nobody's going to do that. Like that's, it, it just takes too long to try to assert that. And even then your Merkle tree is gonna be absolutely enormous in terms of like you trying to avoid any sort of weird ways in which you can manipulate it. I, I, so yeah, th this, is, this is a, a good example of the difference between um, uh, the the things that a human being should be paying attention to with regard to least authority decisions versus um, integrity. Whether you do a, a Merkle tree or not, uh, the integrity is still with regard to precisely one version of things. Whereas the policy decisions are intended to be stable over at least minor version changes, where of course integrity can't be stable over the most trivial um, uh, version change. Um, uh, so having the the um, you know the integrity uh, ultimately be about the, the particular bits, but have the um, the, pol the the policy awareness the 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 policy decisions that some human programmer is going to make be in terms of an abstraction that a human programmer can think about in a stable way over time. I think, I think we need to find a way for that to coexist. We could generate these policy files from such a thing, but I do not yeah. think the policy file themselves can be written in such a manner. Okay, okay, okay. I think that's I think that's a very promising direction. Um, that uh, that would actually kill two birds with one stone, or or I, we really need another metaphor for that concept. Um, but um, uh, but in any case, uh, it might be that the tofu generated thing is at the module level uh, uh, purely uh, and is capturing in detail one version of things because it includes the, integri the, the integrity and then the stable policy overrides that are human maintained that color the tofu generated policy file 
that that human maintained thing is actually written as a statement about packages. And then those two things together get um, uh, um, used to generate the policy file that should apply. So you basically take a, a tofu generated thing plus a package level set of overrides and then you regenerate something that's of the same format as what the tofu generated, but which is colored according to the package level imposition of policy. That seems fine to me. Um, I just can't, I can't do package level data at the runtime. Uh, there's, there's a lot right. of issues. So okay, this sounds, okay. this sounds very good. Yeah, as long as you're okay with that build step, I'll help build whatever. Yeah, because that, that way the, uh, the, the awareness of packages is only in translating uh, from the tofu output to the policy file used for enforcement, uh, both of which are expressed at the module level and can be the files that we're looking at here. And it's just the, it's just the transformer tool that needs to understand this other um, uh, expression of human policy. Ironically, the term policy... On the topic of performance, of uh, there's some interesting things of note. Uh, this does slow down some specific things, and particularly loading C++ modules becomes much slower because we have to do a double load of them. Um, However, with the dependencies hash declared here, as long as you don't include true. I dropped. Did everybody drop? Just me? Uh, you, you did drop. Uh, you're back now. Yeah, you, uh, so, you stopped in mid-sentence and then your screen share went away. Uh, uh, so I was trying to talk about performance. Um, so there are some real life performance problems that's part of like this slightly odd structure um, for the policy files. Uh, generating these takes time, um, unfortunately. So uh, for medium-ish sized app, you're looking at five minutes easy for a fresh uh, generation of these policies just on integrity. Uh, and so that's not great, but we can do some caching and bring it down to you know five, 10 seconds on secondary runs, which I think is fine. Um, for Actual loading performance, there's an oddity here, which makes sense once you think about it. Um, if you include dependencies, your app loads a lot faster uh, because your <laughs> will prevent you from searching around on disk. Um, Node does a lot of statting to see if files exist. And if your policy mandates their location, um, if you don't include true values, your app will load significantly faster. So, um, the, so you're saying that in the if it, it, um, that in the true case or in the un, the unpolicied case that we currently have, that Node searches more than one location for a file of a given name. Oh yeah, it searches a ton of. <laughs> it searches. What are the things. what are the different locations it looks at? Oh. Uh... I mean, just, just, you know, just for uh, approximation. There's some stuff in the home directory. It crawls up your directory path. Um, it searches a bunch of different file extensions. It checks for, so like, okay. If it's a built-in, just stop there. Uh, otherwise, it tries to load it as a file and it's gonna load a bunch of different uh, extensions. This is actually false uh, just because of simplicity and some bugs that we can't get rid of. Uh, then I'll try to load it as a directory. If the directory has a package JSON, it'll do something. If it has an index file, it'll do something else. Index uh -huh. files also have to check all their extensions. 
uh, if it's not in any of those locations, it'll start uh, crawling through your node modules and node modules is recursive. Um, and so there's also yeah. some things like, is it, what is it? Node, yeah. And then there's these three special directories that'll start crawling to. Um, and it'll do all those file directory searches all within those. Um, it's bad. Wow, I had no idea. And so that's part of why location is actually important here because you can do OWASP symlink style attacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this um, stuff yeah, is all, all calculated ahead of time and in, in, in install time or whatever? Uh, no, this is all at runtime. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah they, for, for knowledge of similar systems that did that, you know, that searched in several locations. Yeah, there's a lot of vulnerabilities that come in with that. So um, there's a lot of just bad behavior we can't get rid of. But if you've got a policy, we can at least get angry about it. Okay, so that's that's really nice. That's that's. I mean, it's really not. I mean, the problem's not nice, but the fact that the policy files. Uh, so if a policy if a policy file never says true, if it always specifies the location then you've completely suppressed the searching activity? Correct. Well, that's great. Which makes it load extremely fast compared to normal. Yeah, and that'll cause much more adoption than any degree of security difference. Uh, yeah, but they might not actually get any security if they just run it for that. <laughs> well, uh, nevertheless, I mean, what, they're, what they've done is they've taken a step that enables the next steps towards differential security to be much easier next steps. It's that first step that's the hard one. And it sounds like we've got a very good non-security carrot for getting them to take the first step. Yes. And so uh, the other things we can do is we could add logging for those trues. Uh, and we, because of the search paths, uh, it would be prohibitively hard to put all dependency specifiers on the left-hand side here. Um, and so I suspect we may have to tweak our policies in some way that allow for uh, scopes, kind of like packages level resolution rather than direct one specifier to one location mapping. We'll, we'll have to figure that out in the future. I'm not prepared to take that on. Okay. Um, so is all this being run, what is the status of frozen primordials in Node right now? Uh, so we have a frozen intrinsics flag that does run. Uh, most people okay. don't run with it because it breaks, in particular, some very big NPM packages. Um, there is pushback from Chrome in particular about encouraging usage of that flag. And so uh, it is hard for us to convince authors to uh, use that behavior more than we thought. Is this uh, primary, the breakage primarily because of the override mistake? It is entirely to my knowledge of, because of the override mistake. Okay, so I saw a PR from Guy Bedford uh, that, um, uh, was doing the accessor uh, trick for suppressing the override mistake and for masking the override mistake uh, that was basically doing it, if I recall correctly, um, uh, he was, uh, uh, Bedford's PR was doing it over all of the um, uh, primordial methods that are on prototypes. Um, uh, for, for methods not on prototypes, even though that's in theory a problem, it's not, Practically, it's not a problem. Uh, Salesforce found that they only needed to do it uh, practically on five of the primordial prototypes. Um, uh, object, uh, uh, function, array, uh, and I don't remember what else. Um, uh, yeah, 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 I yeah, was, this one. I was on so this one. So I'll take a look. So, Okay, so this one says closed. Was it closed because it was merged or because it was rejected? It's probably merged. Yeah, merged. Okay. 
Okay. Well, in that case, the override. So if this is merged, doesn't that mean that the override mistake should now be a non-issue? Uh, not necessarily, because it's still a problem if people freeze things in their own code. Ah, 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 ah. No, that's true. That's true. Uh, how, much of a, how much of that problem did you find? I don't know. I've been gone. Okay. So the Salesforce, as far as I know, the Salesforce experience is by just doing this workaround on the five primordial prototypes, that the problem uh, uh, essentially practically went away. That may be the case. I haven't looked. Yeah. Uh, and then he also had a different PR, which is the one I said was blocked, about removing direct access to buffer and process. Right, um, right, right, right. That one I've been following, and that one, there's a, there that that one is a performance concern that he's been trying to address with better benchmarking, and I don't I don't know what the what the latest status on that uh, is. It was through benchmarking for uh, Mateo, but James put some complaint in here that was not about benchmarking. Okay. And anyway. this performance problem, if we had the right hook from V8, we could just make the performance problem go away. Uh, V8 internally has the ability to do this. They just haven't exposed it. Um, <sighs> You can talk to Yang. Yang seems open to the idea after us nagging him for like a year. Oh, okay. He wants us to okay. Stop. So, so I'll say that from historical experience, if you were able to get the V8 team to do something reasonable after only a year of nagging, you're doing very well. Anyway, so Yang seems open to the idea. We might have to write the patch, but they, they've gone and stopped complaining as much. Um, so yeah, that's about it for node PRs. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Kamavis, uh, especially since you're uh, only rarely able to attend, um, uh, is there something that you'd like to talk about? Uh, yeah, so I just want to take a, a quick look at um, my cow tail stuff and yes, yes. sort of compare yes, it yes. to uh, the membrane stuff. Let me see. Good. Um, can you see my screen? I can see your screen, yes. Um, so over here, uh, right now we're looking at... Um, lar lar larger font is... Larger, new. coming right up. Um, so what we're looking keep at... Go here, keep going. Keep going. Okay, okay that's, my browser that's is very slow to respond to my request. Oh, I see. Um, so we're looking right now at uh, at my Sesify project, and I've done a little slice of work that's using this new uh, cow tile part. And so the the uh, I'm gonna have to make this part bigger as well. That's not the one I want. I want this one. And I guess I'll make that full screen. Okay, um, so what is cut up? Uh, the goal of it is to, um, given a source reference tree, and a reference tree just being like a, a series of objects or functions or this sort of thing, um, be able to create a, a sort of view on it via a series of proxies um, such that these uh, sort of protect the modification of that source. Uh, for example, when I'm in Cessify, when I have module at exports, I don't want these module at exports to be modified by other modules, and so I want to protect them. Um, the, you should, uh, the creator of the source, the, or whoever has the direct reference to the source, should still be able to make modifications to that source, and you should be able to see those modifications when you have the view. Um, and the person that has the view should be able to, um, to make writes that shadow but don't affect the source. Um, and then, you know, sorry, wait, wait, uh, I'm a little confused by the term source here. You yeah. mean the the object, the, the dynamic objects that are exported, the dynamic state of those objects, or or, or do you mean the source code? Yeah, no, I mean the uh, the the object. 
So um, okay. So here, okay. yeah, I'm using the term source and view to refer to the thing that we're sort of putting this sort of proxy around, um, okay. and and then those actual proxies. Um, there's probably better okay. terms to use here, but um, for now, what I chose is source and views. Um, okay. The the views should be able to do local writes, so writes that shadow the source, um, but not affect the source. Okay. Um, and. And then I guess preserve some reference structure like circular, circular references. Um, and so I have I have this working, and I'm fairly happy with it. Um, you, let's see. I'll, I'll go to this this one. Um, so it is like this copy creating thing. I'm calling it copy. Copy is not the best term. It's more like that view or proxy or something. Um, and so once you do that, you can create, uh, you get a copy creating function and it, there's sort of like a space on which uh, you get unique copies um, or, or there's the deep duplication of copies via a weak map is happening inside that space. Um, and so if I have some object and I create a copy, then um, it's different than the original, but things like uh, you know, circular references are preserved. Um, and if you try to copy the same object twice, you just get the same object back. Or, or you get the um, the same reference, the copy. Um, and so, and this should work for things like classes. Um, and, and that's so no, no, let me just, let me make sure I follow since I didn't know sure I got, I followed in detail. Yeah. Uh, everything you've, saw, you've shown so far would be observably equivalent with membranes. Is that correct? Uh, yes, and I have a, I have a, a difference a comparison to membranes here. Okay, um, great. So so I was yeah kind of looking at prior art and see if it it solved my use case. And there's like immer.js or imer however it's pronounced. And there's muta and then there's a es membrane. Um, okay. So for the membranes, it, this it was neat. Um, it, so one memory does uh, like bidirectional. Reference wrapping. Yeah. So if you pass something in, it also wraps that, and I'm not doing that. Yeah. Um, so oh, okay. that, that was a, that's neat, and maybe I do need that. Maybe um, you know I'm a little unsure if that one's necessary. Um, it, it depends what your goals are. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, yes, memory also supports revocation. We don't really need that because we're just you're, we're just trying to def make, you know add some defense to the module exports. So I, I didn't see that necessary for my case, but that's fine. Um, but the, the problem is it doesn't didn't seem to support shadowing, like on the view or on the copy, making writes to that that don't affect the original. Oh no, it 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 does uh, indirectly. What happens is when you create a membrane, you parameterize it with distortions, and then there's this um, uh, you know, and then the there's this uh, expressiveness issue, which is what kinds of extortions distortions, not extortions. What kind of distortions can you express? But a the local only write uh, is one of the distortions in, in particular that I know it supports because uh, that's actually what he's doing for the motivating DOM case, where um, two different views of the same DOM node, let's say Alice and Bob, have distinct views of the same underlying DOM tree. Uh, that when Alice adds an expando property, you know, just adds adds some non-standard property to a DOM node through the view, she only sees it through her view. It's not on the real DOM node, and it's not on Bob's view. And that sounds like what you're talking about. Yes, OK. So it, so it can, you can do that, um, but it requires, uh, it requires some configuration. Right. And ideally, even revocation would be expressed as a distortion. Sort of the ideal, the ideal uh, form of, of is, that the, is that you have a membrane creating abstraction um, that in which in the absence of distortion it's as transparent as possible and then every deviation from transparency is by virtue of an added distortion and revocation itself is a is a is a deviation from full transparency so ideally it should be a distortion I think revocation probably from an engineering point of view, it still makes sense in the, in the membrane 
uh, yeah. library to go ahead and support it as a special case just because the mechanism for um, bringing it about uh, is so special. Um, um, and it's, I, it's very, I can configure the distortion in such a way where it does this for for everything that makes sense? It should, like, yeah. That? That's, that, that, that's the goal. If you find that there's a distortion that you need that you cannot express in terms of that system for expressing distortions, uh, then that would definitely be an issue to be raised where we should take a look at, at the expressiveness of the distortion mechanism. Uh -huh. and, and I um, I don't need to like whitelist certain keys because I don't know what the thing that I'm going to be wrapping looks like. Uh, the um, In the absence of distortion, uh, there's no whitelisting needed. Everything is just as transparent as possible. Uh, you, can, you should be able to do a distortion that brings about a whitelisting policy uh, that it only shows things that are that are whitelisted to be shown. Uh, but that would itself, but any kind of whitelisting policy like that would itself be a distortion. Okay, uh, but I can like sort of apply. So I, the local only rights is a type of distortion. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and that I can one, like, like, I, like I said, I, I know I know that one is supported because he's using it for the DOM. Mm -hmm. And I can do that via like some sort of wildcard thing. Uh, yeah, I guess so, because that matches the DOM case, whether you can add yeah. whatever you want. Okay. All right. Uh, well, so then I need to go a little deeper into membranes. That sounds useful. Um, the, yeah, one thing that I'm now running into with, with my implementation of Kowtow, which has probably been addressed in the ES membranes, is, um, uh, uh, well, I'll get there in a second. Um, so, so that's that's the goal of it. Um, so currently, when you call methods or getters and setters that are on the um, the source, then they're they're uh, called with with the the view as this. Um, and then, I feel like I'm I'm doing a lot of sort of like hacks to work around proxy invariants, and I don't. Really, I don't know why proxy invariants exist. Maybe I need to read the I, document. I, but. Yeah, so I can tell you the philosophy there. Uh, it's very, very simple to state, uh, which is um, when we added the reflection to uh, the reflective things like get own property descriptors yeah. uh, to, to ECMAScript 5, um, uh, it took us a while to understand what the, how to think about them well, which is when, when a property descriptor says that a property is configurable, that's not making any kind of commitment with regard to uh, what, what then happens in the future. Um, when a property descriptor says that a property is not configurable, that's making a stability commitment. Mm -hmm. And it's a stability commitment that um, uh, that the the um, that others should be able to rely on without having to trust the object that made the commitment, uh, because you're not asking the object um, if the property is configurable. You're 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 using a system query, like object that get on property descriptor or reflect dot get on property descriptor. You're asking it about the property, um, and. Uh, if that, and then, you know, then it in turn traps to the internal method, which in the case of the, pro the proxy traps to a handler. But just before I get to, to the proxies, just sort of speaking historically, um, uh, we were faced with um, uh, this chaos of host objects, DOM objects, for example, that, were, that just none of the rules applied to it. But there was also historically no explicit plot property descriptors. So when we created the system of property descriptors, we decided that it's always legal for an object to always claim that a property is configurable and then not allow it to be configured um, because saying it's configurable is not a commitment to, to enabling it to be configured. It's only the other way around. Saying it's yeah. not configurable is a commitment that it's stable. So even a host object, if it ever says that a property of it is non-configurable, it must only say that 
if it's then permanently committed never to changing the stability, you know, never to changing the things that non-configurable guarantees is stable. So that so that's in general the philosophy behind all of the invariants. Um, uh, and um, uh, the and all, and all, and something is stable. Um, being stable is a one-way switch. Once something is stable, it's stable forever. That's what, what we mean by stable. Yeah. Um, okay, that, that makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I had a, some issues working around that because, uh, for example, I want you to be able to modify um, the, the prototype of a copy. Like here, class A, we create a copy of it, and it's B. I want you to be able to modify the prototype without affecting A. Um, and so I had to be a little clever as to what the actual proxy target was in order to be able to replace its prototype, which is non-configurable in the case of the case of the class syntax. Yeah. Right, right, right. So, so, uh, so in the case of the class syntax, it's still writable. Is it? No, no, maybe it's not writable. Is it? Do you, uh, that's a good that's question. Right. No, that's right. That's right. I think the class commits you to the prototype. I think you're right about that. It's the constructor that's the the one that you can continue to change, uh, but the prototype I think is committed. Oh, the class syntax, and I think for the class syntax that makes some sense because the prototype is an inherent part of the meaning of the class, but it's not really something people think of as a separate object. So, if the same class object, if it had a different dot prototype then it would really you know not mean the same class um uh whereas you can always if you want something like a class in which you can change the prototype you can always do, do that by explicitly just using declared functions uh now uh going back to the your, your issue about uh proxies uh so uh you got that exactly right if the in order to have a proxy for a class in which the proxy allows the prototype property to be changed uh, the proxy has to be careful that the shadow target, the target that the proxy knows about directly, that it not have a, that, you know, that, that that target either not have a prototype property, or if it have a prototype property, that the prototype property is either configurable or writable. Um, if the shadow target has a prototype property that's both non-configurable and non-writable, then you've made a stability commitment that you can then not violate. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I don't. I, I'm not looking for like uh, to go over the code in in this case, but I ended up yeah doing some some silly stuff here where I'm just like providing yeah, dummy there, targets. There's something. Yeah. There's something I didn't follow there. In, in going back up to uh, up above where you had your your example. Um, um, yeah. That, which is. If I understand what Mark just said correctly, when you've made your your your, your shadow copy of A into B, well, A was a class. Classes have a certain semantics, um, one of which is you 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 can't fiddle with their prototype after the fact, and therefore, in making that copy, if if you can make that modification on the copy, then it's it's not just that you're doing a, 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 a shadow right thing, it's that you've changed the semantics of what it is. And it seems to me that that assignment of b.prototype.abc ought to fail um, because the thing you copied was a class. Uh, this is still legal with a class, right? You just can't oh, okay. replace the prototype. Oh, right, right. You can't replace the prototype itself. Got it. Yeah. So I, I do right. sort of replace the prototype itself inside of the create. Um, right, because you're shadowing yeah. everything, including the prototype. Okay, got it. Never mind. I, carry on. Okay. Well, okay. The, so the, the, the membranes will, of course, shadow everything. Uh, but but ah. the membranes will, will, will make the same guarantee, will make the same stability guarantees for the shadow that, that you know, that, so that they're, Basically, passing whatever in whatever way the original guaranteed stability 
the undistorted membrane will guarantee the same stability for for the 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 membrane forms. Okay, uh, that makes sense. Uh, I I need to learn how to properly configure the ES membrane stuff. I did try using the tool and I got a little confused. Um, yeah. Um, while you're doing that, by the way, if you have suggestions about better ways to enable distortions to be expressed, better ways to parameterize membranes with distortions, um, uh, keep your eyes open for, for opportunities to improve the way in which we parameterize membranes with distortions. Yeah, do we, is, are there examples of how to use the, the ES membrane module? Okay. I hope so. I guess there's like tests and stuff I can make it. Okay. Um, so this was written. This is written by um, by Alex Al, um, Alex Vincent, mm -hmm. who often appears in the CES meetings. He's not here today, uh, yeah. but um, uh, you should you should contact you should contact him with any questions. He's very very helpful. Great. I, I loved reading this, by the way, because it was basically has been my progress so far. I was like, first you might want to do this, but then you. You know, you run into this problem, and then you try this. And that was like <laughs> my own history, and then like reading into the future of where I'm going to. So that was really cool to see. Um, okay, so the next part is uh, yeah. So currently, I, I'm seeing some failures in Kato on um, dealing with typed arrays um, because I'm also like proxying them and then calling their getters and setters with the proxy as the this. And um, I got this incompatible receiver on uh, the typed arrays of get uh, or the getter for length. So oh. I haven't investigated that much yet, but this is um, seems to be a problem. So maybe I need to like detect typed arrays and then clone them instead of proxying them. Um, uh. I haven't investigated yet. But that's something I'm stuck on. So you should not need to if you're doing this in a mem so membranes. I don't think need to. So mm -hmm. it yeah this this depends on um, uh, whether you're crossing the streams whether you're whether you're um, if you're applying the genuine uh, typed array dot prototype dot length not to an instance of typed array but to uh, a proxy for an instance of typed array, uh, then I would expect this to fail. So that's probably what you're seeing. Yeah. Um, uh, but if you're doing it through more of a membrane mechanism, then when you ask a proxy for a typed array for the length, then the length request should go back through the proxy, and then the actual length should um, uh, should only happen on the real one, not on the proxy. So I do that for um, for va values like properties that have that are values, um, and but in this case it's a getter. So in the case of getters, I do set the this as the proxy, um, and that works so far in, in all my tests. But that that's failing on this one. Um, okay. So so does anything break if you do the other the the if you if you um, use, okay, let, let me make sure that I understand. You've got, um, I, I, you have, for the two sides of your membrane, you have names for them, I suppose, view and source. Those were, yeah. the, those were the names. Okay. Yeah. So if on the view side, you have a proxy for a typed array, and you do, or, or, um, uh, and you do a dot length on it, and dot length is a accessor property, then it faults on the proxy for typed array. It does the lookup, I mean, it faults to the handler. The handler says that the receiver is the proxy. Um, and then the, what the membrane would do is it would translate um, the receiver from the view side to the source side and the object that corresponds on the source side to the proxy receiver would be the original object. 
So that would be the thing that would be yeah. um, I guess, passed um, through as, the, as the, this binding for the getter. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Uh, I, I, I guess it was the, uh, if, if the getter, what I wanted to do, I wanted to have the this for the getters be the proxy to avoid making mutations to the original as a side effect of the getter, but maybe, uh, maybe no, that's the fine. thing is once, okay. yeah, once you're in the getter, so the way we think of the membrane thing, and this is, is that once you're in the getter that's on the source side, you're on the source side. Yeah. So any, any mutations that are made by code that's, you know, the, by, by ob objects that are on the source side of the boundary are actions that are taken on that side of the boundary. They're no longer actions that are being taken on the view side of the boundary. Yeah, so th that especially makes sense in the membrane uh, mental model. And then I, here, I guess I'm trying to like, just like lazily uh, <laughs> make fresh instantiations of modules without actually like doing a full reinstantiation of module. And so that's why I was thinking the getter should affect the, the view as opposed to the source. But um, it, maybe it's just a, uh, too much of a mess uh, to try to okay. actually that. Yeah, so, so with regard to mutation, which would typically not be a getter issue, but would, be a, would, would quite often be a setter issue, um, the, it sounds like the intuition that might fit what you're thinking is more of a copy on write intuition, yeah. Where it's not so, not so much which side of a boundary you're on, but it's more of a chronology issue. Yeah. So th this is definitely trying to be more of a copy on writing. That's where like the cow part of the name comes from. Um, oh, 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 right. I forgot all about that. Right, yeah. right, right, right. Okay. Copy on write. So for copy on write, um, okay. So let's, okay. For copy on write, a good way to probe our intuitions here is assume that all of the source objects are really transitively frozen. So we, can, so we simply cannot make any mutations in place. And now what we're trying to do with some kind of membrane-like mechanism, not necessarily a membrane, but we're trying to do with some kind of pervasive proxying is emulate what that graph of objects would be doing if they were not frozen. Yeah. Uh, this is interesting. I've never thought about, thought, tried to think this through in terms of proxies. The XS uh, embedded JavaScript engine, the, the JavaScript mm -hmm. engine from the modable, modable folks, um, that actually does this inside their virtual machine <clears throat> in order to enable um, uh, primordial mutable objects or not just, not just primordial ones, but application mutable objects to have their initial state be ROMable is they actually have a, inside their virtual machine um, for their bookkeeping on what the state of an object is. They um, refer to the ROMable version um, uh, from a, pointer in a table in RAM uh, so that the pointer can be changed to point at a difference record that masks the, um, what's, what's in ROM. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, okay. So if you're going to try to do this, this is really interesting. If you're going to try to do this for with proxies, try to do a genuine just copy on write, where it's not a, where the, the boundary is never one in which there's mutation on the other side of the boundary. Um, that that the yes. yep. change made by a mutation is itself defining what the boundary is that you're trying to bring about. Um, so in that case. Basically, for every original object, for every source object, 
and let's ignore the lazy creation. For every source object, we have a corresponding proxy, and the proxy has a shadow target, and the shadow target, we might as well just use the shadow target for the mutations, since the handler all you know will always have access to the real target, the you know frozen real target, as well as the shadow target. Um, the shadow target, if you're just trying to emulate everything's mutable all the time, let's say, then the shadow target, nothing would ever get frozen or non-configurable over there. You want to maintain everything maximally mutable. Uh, and then when you execute a original getter, then you would do exactly what you stated, which is you would execute the getter with the proxy, not the original object, as the this binding. And then you would run into the problem, the error that you saw here, which is um, the cause your, yeah, the incompatibility, and this, yeah, and this runs into the problem of internal slots, the problems that there's some, spe you know, some special object types that have internal state that's not represented as um, property state that uh, the, the, the built-in methods for that abstraction can get at directly, but that cannot be virtualized. You can only virtualize it by virtualizing the method, uh, by replacing the method. Um, yeah, so any, if the source is like using something that's in the closure, uh, we're also, you know, we'll be affecting that same closure and not a copy of the thing that's in the closure. Um, right, right, right. If the, if the, yes, that's right. If the, if the, if the original graph is, has functions that close over state, then clearly there's nothing the proxy can do so that it can both use the function and not have the function modify the lexical state that it captured. I mean, there's just no way to do that. Um, the only thing, the only recourse you would have is to just not call those functions at all, but replace them with uh, brand new functions that emulate the, the behavior you want to the degree that it can be emulated. So I, you could I, also I, do the, Yeah, I'd just like to add that in, if it's a few cases like UN data array, you can just redefine those classes entirely. Yeah, I'm curious um, what, who, what, what classes or, or what primitives are, um, you know, are, are protecting the receiver type? How, how common so, is So among the primordial, the JavaScript primordial, first of all, it's very, very common with host objects. So host objects are just mm -hmm. this completely separate category of thing. Uh, for JavaScript standard objects, uh, the keyword you want to look for is exotic. Um, and you also just want to look for uh, definitions of internal slots. But, but altogether, there's not a lot of them. Um, one of the, you know, um, uh, uh, or there's not a lot of them in which the internal slots are also mutable state. Um, uh, one of the clearer examples, the example I always come, to, come back to is just such a clear example, is date. Uh, date actually is, is actually a, can, it does not represent a particular historical date. It represents, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a mutable representation of some dates, which date it represents, you can mutate. Um, and uh, that current date that it represents is kept in an internal slot, and the methods, the built-in methods on date.prototype uh, can access that internal slot directly. Um, uh, that's also true with typed arrays. Um, it's true with, re uh, no, it's not true with regex, but I don't think. 
I think everything mutable with regexp is in a property. I don't know. Okay. Good. That uh, that gives me something to to look for uh, in further research. Yeah. 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 But I, lo I love the idea of copy on write as being a distinct, you know, as, as, as a non-membrane example of a transitive proxy. Because every, so far, everything that's looked like transitive proxying has looked like a membrane. Yeah, I wonder, we could almost, um, <laughs> like, wrap it in a try-catch, and if it has the inca incompatible receiver error, we can uh, <laughs> do it naked. But I don't know. Well, you still wouldn't be. You still wouldn't know how to emulate the side effect if you got that. Yeah. Yeah. In the case of length, it would be okay because it's a query and not a side effect. Well, it still wouldn't be okay because you wouldn't know how to emulate the length. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this, like, there's nothing I can do about the state enclosures other than like put it in a readme that it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. handle it correctly. Yeah. But uh, cool. Okay, that's great. Um, I don't think I need any more time on on this. Okay. 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 Thanks. What is the original meaning of kowtow? I have some some you know <laughs> yeah, connotations yeah, so associated with it, but I'm not actually sure what the meaning is. Yeah, it um, comes from Chinese and is a uh, very intense bowing. Um, <laughs> the, uh, hit your head on the floor. Okay, okay. Bow so yeah, you gotta bow, bow before good. the power of proxies. Yeah, the, 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 thing, okay. the thing that immediately popped into my head when you when you described this last week and you said, well, it wasn't really copying, it's more shadowing. And my first thought was shadow on modify. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's somtau. Um, uh, Somtau Sucharitakul is a science fiction writer. Um, <laughs> cousin, his, this is really just this one of those, you know, your brain follows these associations. His yeah. cousin, Akara, was a programmer I worked with at PayPal who's very interested in actor computation. Um, um, anyway, just apropos of nothing. That, that was uh, Somtau? Somtau. Like that at T O W. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, we're done with Kowtow. We've got 15 minutes left. Uh, Bradley's dropped off. So um, uh, the um, the import um, uh, proposal from Mike Samuel is. Uh, um, I, I'm not familiar enough with it to discuss it in the absence of Bradley. I don't know if anybody else here is. No. Okay, uh, so other topics for our remaining 15 minutes. Uh, is there any um, uh, assistance that I can provide over the weekend in uh, prepping for pitching um, uh, the um, Infix Bang and its, and its uh, uh, Shadows and Penumbras to um, uh, uh, TC39? Yes. Um, of one thing, uh, I, I'm confident that outside the committee and per, almost as confident inside the committee that the fact that there is a syntactic element to this uh, will lead uh, in standard um, bike shedding style to it absorbing almost all of the energy of the discussion. Is this kind so of like, the, like the, those things they have now in the in the, the the energy absorbing front panels in cars to protect you in a collision? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what to make of that analogy. Um, but in any case, I mean, the, the, the syntax is important. 
Yep. Uh, I don't want to bike shed on specifically what the syntax is, but arguing about whether it justifies syntactic support is actually an argument worth having yeah. because I am very, very shy about proposing syntax. I'm generally the most vocal one on the committee at killing other people's attempts to extend the syntax. Um, and, uh, but on this one, having tried to do this for many years in different ways without syntax, uh, I do feel like this one is a is is a justified uh, need for new syntax. Without um, uh, without taking a position on the exact character glyphs that are used, have you applied yeah. any of the syntactic issues with Waldemar? Uh, no, I have not. I have not. Um, uh, the uh, I think the Waldemar. Uh, uh, the Waldemar uh, thing would re really becomes crucial when we try to pin down what the concrete syntax is. Okay. Okay. Because um, uh, you know Wal Waldemar basically has this incredible ability to um, spot syntactic ambiguities, including those that are caused by semicolon insertion. Uh, the kind of thing that, you know, all of the rest of us would have to, you know, turn to an automatic tool to do what we can't possibly, what a human being can't possibly simulate in their head. Waldemar will just tell you what the ambiguity is. It's just amazing. Yeah, I used to um, think I was really good at analyz analyzing the consequences of syntax until I met Waldemar, and, and now I just, I, I don't think that anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, but. Um, uh, uh, in, in terms of concrete syntax, by the way, I will just go ahead and um, uh, mention that uh, Michael Fig and Kate uh, have both noticed that the optional chaining syntax is question mark dot, and therefore a natural choice that, that to settle on that resolves the conflict with TypeScript uh, would be bang dot. Right. The, 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 the intuition there is it's like dot, but you have a modifier, and we have right. now precedent for that. And so this would be another one of those, which kind of makes it also go down a little more smoothly, as well as the, uh, avoiding the, uh, the, the conflict with TypeScript. Yeah, unfortunately, bang dot is exactly what TypeScript does. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, oh. because it's because it's because it's that's right. He, he's right. It's that, that's not null, and then it's doing because it. it's check if it's not. It's it's uh, this one is not null, and then and so, then yeah, property access. That is correct. Yeah, this is oh. without getting in it, into it too much. Um, the the one similar thing to that uh, would be dot bang, and that expert issue. But yeah, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I would say more. Oh God! To have the optional chaining be question mark dot, and to have the um, the eventual send be dot bang is really disturbing. In any case, so this was exactly the, the uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of practicing exactly the going down the premature bike shedding on the concrete <laughs> syntax. It's um, very seductive. Yeah, uh, so, so I think that focusing the argument to the degree that we do on syntax about why syntax is justified here in general, um, and uh, that's something that you will have a good intuition for, especially because you have so much historical use of using eventual send in support of distributed object computing. Right. Dean will be there and can speak also for the Midori experience right. on distributed object computing. Right. Um, uh, and I, obviously, I can speak for the um, uh, for some of the e experience as well, but. But to the degree to which the e-experience can be spoken of from some from you rather than from me, I think it makes it rhetorically stronger. Right. Uh, the other thing that 
uh, I think altogether should be more of the focus of the conversation anyway, uh, is the semantics rather than the syntax. Is yeah. why is it that promises need a new extension point? And why is it that this is the right extension point? Right. And I think, um, I mean, my glib answer to that is probably not, um, is probably not the most useful in this conversation, which is that, which is when promises were put into JavaScript initially, the work was not completed. Um, and this is simply completing the work that was, which was hinted at, you know, that was foreshadowed, uh, you know, foretold, it's foretold in the prophecies, but never realized. And now we are, we are bringing it about. Um, so I think, I think all of that is worth saying, but the argument for hit from history only goes so far. It's, it's, that's right. it's worth framing think, I, think, I think a lot of people who have not been immersed in our experience with promises to them promises are JavaScript promises. And that's kind of the extent of their, uh, you know, that defines the boundaries of their universe. Um, yeah. And, 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 and the thing is, is that the, one of the things I've noticed is um, in, in, in my conversations, by the way, in my conversations with folks in the, in the JavaScript, uh, among the JavaScript developers here at Evernote, um, uh, they were tremendously excited by this. Um, um, but um, part of that is because now Evernote is, you know, by virtue of me being a, a co-champion, putting its, you know, its name behind this, they feel a sense of ownership, um, which okay. actually I think is very cool and very encouraging. But um, I've also had the pushback from, from other folks where, um, um, and, and I don't quite understand this, but, but the, the, the extent to which you talk about the shortcomings or, or the deficiencies of the um, status quo, if they have invested a lot of uh, time and energy in mastering the status quo, they take that as a personal attack. Uh, I don't understand that in this context. Uh, the proposal we're making uh, is upwards compatible with the status quo and fits pretty smoothly into oh, it as I, a... I, I, I totally agree with you there. And, and uh, I, I would consider that to be a, a, a definitive argument. But just even looking at some of the tone of some of the... Uh, a couple of the people who posted issues on our uh, GitHub uh, 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 repository for the proposal that reflected a degree of, of, of non-understanding and um, that I found very, very frustrating and you know, kind of had to res forcibly restrain myself from saying, you know, impolitic things because it's like, you know, you know, you know, they know not whereof they speak. Um, Really, rather than oh, you, you ignorant fool. Um, and yeah, I th thank, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you for restraining yourself, Chip. Yes, yes. Uh, but I'm I'm quite confident that we're going to get not just from uh, uh, members of the committee, but certainly from some members of the committee, a lot of pushback of that flavor. And so, thinking about how to respond in a in a uh, um, constructive and, and, and uh, um, positive way mm -hmm. is, yeah. is one, yeah, one point to make about the history, by the way, is that the promises, the, you know, the extended promises that make use of the extension point that we're proposing was to do distributed objects and the and and you know without the syntactic sugar, but with this basic semantics of promise extension, not quite done this way. Right. Uh, Q and Q connection. Uh, Q is very much the you know right. the most important 
preceding library that led to the promises that we standardized in ECMAScript 6. Right. Uh, queue connection is the extension of it over the network with an eventual send operator and the methods on promise.prototype that we're, that we're proposing to add to promise.prototype. We're basically just proposing to continue to adopt more of Q right. into promise.prototype. Right. The, extension, the extension point is not quite the same as the Q extension point. Um, uh, and that's because we've, you know, we figured some things out since we did the Q thing. And I think our extension point is better. Yeah. Uh, but the main thing is that Q connection in deployment rapidly became impractical as a way to do distributed objects because of the lack of weak references, that the import-export tables just grew without bound because you couldn't drop anything. Right. And that, that the reason why it made sense for us not to push on promises for remote object computing then, and it does make sense to push on it now, is because it would coexist with weak reference. I think, I think, I think, if not leading with that, certainly front loading that as part of the pit pitch would be uh, very helpful. Um, uh, because having a clean answer to, uh, you know, why now is, is good. Um, and I, I think the, the historical connection to Q is also, also helpful. Um, I mean, one of the things that I, I, I really liked about the, um, uh, uh, the design that, that, that Michael wrote up, and um, I, don't, I, I don't know, if, Michael, if you get most of the credit for that or where this kind of emerged from, but the degree to which it's a, it's a hook for incorporating distributed computation into JavaScript while still preserving the JavaScript um, uh, uh, not having any IO in it uh, property, um, I thought it was just really elegant. And um, that's on, Mark. Uh, okay, um, but in any case, that's I'll, 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 t I'll take most. I won't take all. <laughs> okay, sure. But in any case, um, that 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 um, uh, that's another selling point that it has for me. But I'm not sure that our, you know, one of our standard rhetorical tropes of the, the, um, the, you know, the bifurcation of the standard into the user side and the system side um, is something that is shared um, uh, by uh, a lot of the committee. It's shared by some of the committee. Yeah. Um, and uh, only a tiny amount of the committee is vocally hostile to it. And and most of most of that uh, hostility comes from, of course, one member of the committee. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, in fact, in fact, I don't I don't remember any strong hostility to it other than from that one member. Right. Well, that's interesting. Um, um, so then, then I suppose over the weekend, then we should just be sort of refining our our pitch. Sort of our not 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 the formal pitch, which you which will you will all no doubt be refining, but sort of our you know our our set of of thought out responses to things people might say in in yeah. proper uh, Chip. discussion. So uh, so in the half an hour we have on this topic, uh, could I give you ten the first ten minutes to just do a historical framing? Um, uh, yeah, possibly. I'm not, yeah, uh, let me think about that. Um, um, I'm not sure I actually have all of the important historical context, uh, in my head. Um, um, I mean, I, I certainly know it from, um, what we did at, uh, Electric Communities and my experience with building virtual world systems around these, these concepts. But I think you have a lot more of the context in terms of things like the Q uh, library and um, um, the historical um, uh, 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 exercise of doing this sort of stuff in the JavaScript context. Um, 
it probably might it might be well be worth having me say something if as a you know, from the sort of uh, use case side of things um although i don't know how yeah, well, much yeah go ahead yeah okay well yeah so 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 i'll do okay so i'll i can do more of the historical framing i think you're right about that i'll do i'll do more of the historical framing uh if you can just speak for what it's you know something about why this is a really compelling way to do distributed object computing um and you know um it if you think it's accurate uh, going ahead and capitalizing on the, the fact that it was sort of the same way of thinking about distributed object computing um, that also led you and Croc to invent JSON as a way to send data back and forth. I, th I, that, think, that's, it, I think that's a much more tenuous connection. I think. Uh, okay, um, okay, so, I, so I'll I drop that. Pause. So, um, Okay, have, but in any case, I have one yeah. fundamental question. Um, go ahead. Go, yeah, no, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So, the the one question that came up that I wasn't sure how to answer at all, um, that you might want to prime the audience with an answer before they start asking this question, is uh, why not proxies? What do proxies lack that you need a promise API for? Right. So the thing that proxies lack most of all is uh, the uh, protection from synchronous plan interference. That when you use the bang operator, one of the things that you've got, that, that you have a guarantee of at the call site is that uh, no matter what the operands are, uh, they cannot synchronously interfere with the current um, activity. Okay, that, so that includes that like not, loops and all the other garbage that handlers can manage? Yeah, the, right. um, no, no user code will get, will get executed as a consequence of the bang. No user code provided by the operands will get executed or you know, determined by the operands will get executed until after this turn is over. Yes, I think another thing that and, and this is this is this is a I think a more abstract and harder argument to make, but um, in the context, well, in the traditional web world, you had the browser and you have the web server, and they're in a just a straight up one-on-one -on -one dialogue. Um, and in a lot of the interesting systems and applications that I've built, you have uh, multiple parties, you know, and, and even if it's just a client server, it's N clients and a server all jointly uh, engaging in some kind of of um, mutual interaction, and therefore, any anything which is is synchronous in the sense of um, uh, I send a message to the server, and um, and then I'm blocked until I get something back, uh, means that I am not I am now not participating in this um, this n way conversation until that happens and that would be fine if the only thing I'm doing is waiting for the server to say something but I'm also waiting for all of the other parties in the interaction to say something as well and even though the server is the connection is the medium through which I am interacting with all of those other people um, all of that stuff is all of these kind of ongoing things are necessarily interleaved and um, um, and so um, the minute you get into a world where you have an n-way interaction rather than a two-way interaction, um, you, you, you immediately have to start confronting um, all of this, this interleaving. And, um, and, and this, is a, this is a particularly good set of abstractions for doing that. Um, but that's, that's a really, that's one of those, um, 
um, you kind of you kind of already have to have the problem before you can before you can understand it. Kinds of things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I like both those answers. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. By the way, uh, Michael, um, I know you can't attend in person. Uh, uh, generally, these meetings, I think always these days, these meetings uh, enable people to attend remotely. And mm -hmm. via Agoric, you, uh, you do have full rights to attend. Uh, could you attend remotely? Uh, yeah, definitely. OK, great. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what I need to find out to be able to do that. But yeah, feel free okay, to send good. a pointer to something. Okay. By the way, is, is, is uh, Dean going to be coming? I'm sorry? Is Dean going to be there or is he staying Yes, on? Dean will be there. Yes, Dean's going to Dean's gonna be there. Okay, very good. All right. Okay, it's 3.05. Yep. I call the meeting adjourned. Okie dokie. Catch you later. Okay. Yep.